We sung that song, Lord, have your way with us. This morning, Lord, I pray for that. I continue to pray that as we go through the teaching, as the Sunday Club go through their teaching, as the youth go through their teaching, as the creche go through their teaching, Lord, that we will all allow you to have your way with us. Pray, Lord, as we look at your word, we will learn something new that we didn't know before. And Lord, also that we will come away changed and understanding your kingdom love for us. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, Corinthians. Woo! Yes, it's Mothering Sunday. So there's not going to be a lot of us here this morning. I know various people already shot off and said, got to go, got to go, got to go, got a two hour drive or something. So, um, So I can understand that. Well, we've been looking through the letter of 1 Corinthians, and can anybody tell us who's sort of been here for at least one of them? Seen it on the internet, maybe? Okay, so what have you learned so far? This is a genuine question that I'm going to... God's own people? Yep, we're God's own people. We're his own possession. We are sanctified. Thank you, Steve. Anybody else? What's that? So did you put your hand up? It's like an auction. If you're ever at an auction, don't move. Don't twig, no, because you're bidding. In the years that I used to do auctions and be at the front, I'm glad I was near the auctioneer because I didn't have to move. Sorry, I thought, that's fine, no worries. Still God's own possession, still sanctified. Seriously, don't ever move in an auction. No, it's not that bad, really. Wow. Okay. I'm not sure if this bodes well, but nobody, other than Steve, nobody else willing to sort of venture anything? Okay. Well, we recognise that uh, the city of Corinth is no different from the city of or town of Greenford. It has actually the same values as the city. The letter, not though primarily, but it is about the unity of the church. There's big fights over which leader should they follow which isn't true fighting, it's they're fighting each other. There is a lack of acceptance of the authority of the church leaders, especially from that, the, the, the bunch that say, I only follow Christ. I'll only listen to what Jesus tells me. And uh, you have that in there. Cruc- Christ, cru- Christ crucified is enough. I don't need anything else. Our fumbling speech, especially mine, with the convictional power of the Holy Spirit is enough, is it not? Do you remember these so far, these starting to? Please, I hope. The wisdom of this world has infiltrated their church, and we have to bear in mind that the wisdom of this world can infiltrate any church, including this one. Those who are mature in Christ have Christ's wisdom and are therefore then spiritually mature. And we know that they are true Christ's wisdom by the way that our lives are actually led, the way we live them. One of my hardest sermons, do you remember that two weeks ago? I didn't enjoy doing it. It was one I wanted everybody else to do but me. Actually, church leaders are God's servants, not the servants of the church. We serve the church, but we're not the church's servants. There's a distinct difference. But church leaders are held accountable by God for the kind of church that they build. With me so far? Remember the gold, silver, jewels, hay, straw, wood? Excellent. There's nodding going on. Should anybody on the internet want to know? There is lots of nods going on. And the Corinthians were incredibly self-deceived. They thought they knew better than the leaders. They thought they were doing better. They thought their walk with Christ was better. They actually thought they almost achieved full maturity in Jesus. But their actions so far to date have proven that not to be the case. So, so far we're cheered up, aren't we? So we're looking forward to a really cheerful sermon, yeah? Yeah. One that's going to really inspire us, yeah? I'm sorry, it's not this Sunday. I will be up front with you. Uh, This is another one of those sermons that I'm thinking, goodness me, here we go. But that's fine, because in two weeks' time, you're going to walk out of here feeling a lot more cheerful. But I want to pray that you will be receptive to listening to the teaching that is here, and us all together as a body walk away with it going, okay, I hear what God is saying. 
I've entitled it Sex Scandal Saved. And then sort of subtitled The Father's Love. So that is interesting, isn't it? What's he going on about, so you're all thinking? Well, let's unpack it as we go along. I want to remind you of one verse that we looked at uh, last time. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I've not got it on the screen, but I shall just read it to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. Sorry, 16 to 17. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. See what I mean? You're with me so far. So we're going to look at that. That's part of the the verse that then would cover the next lot of uh, verses we're going to look at, which is going to be finishing off chapter 4, and definitely the whole of chapter 5. I'll be up front, I wanted us to get right to the whole of chapter 6 as well, because you'll walk out here considerably probably feeling a little bit more like, oh yes. So I want you to hold, but we can't do that because it would not be doing justice to chapter 6 if we try and skip through all of them, okay? So you're with me on this, yeah? Okay, so I want you to hold two things in mind. Those two verses I just read to you, but also the verse that you are sanctified. That you as an individual are God's holy temple, Amen. You are where heaven touches earth, amen? Amen. And so then together, collectively, we are God's holy temple. Amen? Amen. Mm, That's a bit of a lesson. Amen? Amen. And we are where heaven touches earth. Amen? Amen? Scary knowing that, isn't it? Because when you think about it, back to what we said in the worship time, Lord, have your way with us. And we're his holy temple. What does that mean? What does that mean about us? What does that mean about what we are to do out there for his kingdom? (sighs) Very strong stuff when you reflect on it just long enough. So, let's read. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 18 to 21. As I said, the opening verse today doesn't bode well, does it? Some of you have become arrogant thinking I will not visit you again. But I will come, and soon, if the Lord lets me, and then I'll find out whether these arrogant people just give pretentious speeches or whether they really have God's power. For the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk, it is living by God's power. Which do you choose? Shall I come with a rod to punish you, or shall I come with love and a gentle spirit? Well, two weeks ago, in the previous verses, Paul was very soft in his admonishment of the Corinthians. But now, he comes with a rod. Or does he? We'll look in a moment. But now, we see a leader who will now show the true extent of the discipline that is required to bring about a halt to the damage that is being done to the kingdom of God. Remember, there's lots of infighting going on. And uh, this is not boding well for the church. It's not boding well for the kingdom of God because if they're in fighting and everybody knows about it in two weeks' time, we'll see what they're also up to outside of the church. It doesn't do any good, does it? It's not a very good witness, is it? Is it? Is having in fighting a good witness of the love of God? Good. With me. This is daft that this is going to go on. Steve, could you do us a favour? There is a white button there, one with a sticker over it. Could you push it, please, and turn it off? Thank you. It's not going to get so hot now. I'm saying it's hot because I'm warm. Right. Let's not have any infighting about it. I've decided, okay? And I have the microphone. I'm the one who's creating the hot air. You just need to take it on board. So, who are the arrogant people that he is talking about here? That some have become arrogant, thinking, I will not visit you again. Let me just remind you again, Paul earlier on, in in earlier on 4, actually reminding them that he is their spiritual father. I know it's Mothering Sunday, but he is is a male, so it's going to be a bit hard for him to be... uh, 
sort of take on that. But, you know, you can mother a church as a male as well as father a church as a male, and vice versa, by the way, not to be, unsex- not to be sexist. But here he's reminding himself that he is the father, spiritual father of the church. So there's probably some of these arrogant lots, as he's calling them, who are probably take, making all these grandiose statements about how life should be, etc. And he is saying, you know, I am hearing about this. And you think I'm not going to return back as your disciplining father. They're probably talking about him and, and courting all these factions in the church. And they think they're going to get away with it. And he's saying, well, you think I'm not coming back? And I am. Now, just, just take that for a moment. It's very easy to think that I've had a conversation with someone over in a corner somewhere about somebody else and it's only between me and them and it's never going to come back on me. Nobody's going to hear about it. Church leaders are not going to hear about it. We may not do. Or you've had a conversation in your house moaning about another church member or moaning about a church leader and I use the phrase slagging them off and you think it's okay it's only between us it's in these four walls they're not going to hear about it that's arrogance that's arrogance because guess what guess who will hear about it who's hearing it let's hear it who's hearing it God sees everything Now here for Paul, he wasn't hearing it from God. He was hearing a a report from some members of uh, Chloe's household. But sometimes that's what God does. He can sometimes reveal to others sometimes what we're up to. Now we're going to come to that because I don't want this to be condemnatory because it's not. There's two reasons why God does that. And we'll come to that. And one of them is actually for the reason, for the health, the spiritual health of the person who is committing the sin. Okay, so we're going to come to that. But who are these arrogant people? Well, he's talking about they're making pretentious speeches. Do you remember the, the city is very much a part of people who want to be eloquent in their speech? So if you sounded good, people thought, oh, this is of God in the church. So, for Paul, these arrogant people are people who are all talk and no action. Power here, when he talks around, uh, I'm going to see whether they really have God's power. The power he means here is solid, enduring effects, i.e. they're not just talking, they're actually doing what they say they're going to do. There's actual power behind. There's an activity, physical activity, of what they're saying. It doesn't like substance. It's not just shallow and passing. In other words, it's not just a great speech at the front and then you walk away. Like Carol. You didn't hear Carol. You know when I said to really hug each other, Carol noticed that I didn't go and hug anyone because I just thought nobody would want to hug me, you see. And then she said, come over here. It's not the do as I say. Come on, come and do what you just said at the front. And I thought she's right. I just thought, you know, nobody's going to want to hug me. (laughs) Timmy didn't. But these people could well be people who stand at church meetings or in the church on a Sunday morning and give all their right talk about what the church is doing wrong, or the leaders. They might come out with good-sounding God talk, picking up and choosing Bible verses, normally out of context, to back up their speech. I will say that I have heard on a number of occasions, I hasten to add, let's just caveat this, not always agree, you know, I don't always just come to Greenfield, I do go elsewhere as well. Or you hear it on the radio, you see it in commentaries, or you see it in people's um, papers, they're really ranting on because they're deeply unhappy. So they start pulling out Bible verses to back up what they're saying. But the Bible verse does nothing to do to relate to what they're talking about. And I find that immensely frustrating. But they can sit there and do all of that. And then when you maybe look at their lives or look at the relational destructive behavior behind them, you sort of think to yourself, well, was that really God speaking through them? Because if there's nothing behind it, there's no substance. If there's no activity from them, then it can't be of God. If their lives are not 
straight and are not right, if there's no righteous action and wholesome talk behind their words, then I would question, like Paul is questioning, is this actually of God? So Paul's sort of saying, well, I'm going to come to you, Corinth, with a rod. Get your affairs in order or else. You've had enough warning. Four and a half years, don't forget. They've had plenty of warning. Don't forget, 1 Corinthians is not the first letter. 1 Corinthians is really 2 Corinthians. There's previously been a letter that he has sent, and he no doubt has sent people to go and talk, and other church leaders have probably told them that you need to sort yourself out. And maybe they've had enough, and Paul is saying, this is it. Enough is enough. But he actually does leave them with a question. You're going to be disciplined. There's no mucking about there. But do you want me to come harsh or gentle? That's what he's saying. This question at the end here. What he's saying is, should I come with a rod or should I come with love and a gentle spirit? Note the phrase, it's what do you choose? You're going to still be disciplined because it needs to happen. But do you want me to come with a rod or a gentle spirit? I think for Paul, he always wants to come with a gentle spirit. Don't think he wants to come and punish them with a rod. And it's imagery that he's using. We'll come to that later. But as one commentary I wrote, Garland writes, in these opening chapters, and that's talking about one to four, Paul insinuates that the church is riven by unnecessary strife, fed by unjustified spiritual pride. Threatening to come after them with a rod, however, seems a bit extreme to settle such problems. But the three cases that now get cited in chapter five, right through to the end of chapter six, makes the threat more understandable. Okay? We're about to see now why, because some of us don't like the idea of needing to have church discipline, as uh, the term or phrase is used. But we will see that actually what's behind it is love. Love of the person who's committing the sin. And I can already see some of you starting to go, oh my life. But hear me carefully. Love is the underpinning reality behind this, okay? You with me? It's like I turned off the heating for a reason. It's so you stayed awake. That was done out of love. One to two. Chapter five, verses one to two. I can hardly believe the report about the sexual immorality going on among you. Something that even the pagans don't do. I'm told that a man in your church is living in sin with his stepmother. You are so proud of yourselves, but you should be mourning in sorrow and shame. And you should remove this man from your fellowship. Remember, the Corinthian church think very highly of themselves. They believe they're so close to Christ that they've got it sorted. They actually almost probably think their highest standing in the city's got. They think they've almost, you know, well, we know Jesus. We really are spiritually sorted. They think they've got the wisdom of Christ. Yet their actions so far to date, their factions, their splitting up, etc., actually proves that their wisdom and values are more of the city. Yeah? Remember that? They want to leaders and, and they want to have eloquent speakers, etc. Well, that's the world wisdom. That's not godly wisdom. So now Paul says, contrast them with the city by sin that they've got. He's stating that you're allowing something in the church that even the city wouldn't allow. Even the pagans wouldn't do what you're allowing in the church. You're allowing a man to be living, to be having sexual relations with his father's wife. Notice it is stepmother. So before we think in incest is going on, let's be cautious. But did you notice that? And it's not that. It's the key thing is actually it's sex outside of marriage. Because I read that and I was like, well, in our today's society, we probably wouldn't bolt at the idea of some stepson and stepmom eventually having a relationship if the father is no longer around. 
In our society, we seem to be so tolerant, we seem to allow anything. It wouldn't be seen as a big issue. I mean, some people, oh, my life, that's disgusting. But actually here, what you've got to remember also, by the way, that probably the stepmother was closer in age to the son than she was to the father. But for me, what I take from this is uh, sex outside of marriage. This is something that he's kicking up against. Now, there's various reasons as to possibly why this man uh, was with his stepmom. Probably money. Probably greed. He was probably had some money. He uh, was probably quite a rich man. And that's probably why the church was allowing it to happen. Partly. But even in Old Testament times and Judaism, the practice that is being described here was actually detestable. It was actually banned even in God's sight. It should not be allowed. Why? Well, why? It's because it's in the Old Testament, and we ain't going to go into that too much. I don't want to go into that, but why do you think the church were allowing it? That's a real question. Even the pagans, even the city thought this was wrong. Yet the church thought they'd allow it. Any reason? Oh. Because he was deceiving his father. Potentially. I hear what you're saying, but we don't think the father's around by the way that it's read, because I think there'll be a big kickoff. And only the man is the church member. She clearly isn't by the way that it's read in there. So she's not around. It's only the man who's the church member. So why do you think the church was allowing that to happen? Sit here next time. No, I'll come to you, but next time, make my life easier. <laughs> because the guy was able to argue that I'm free in Christ to engage in this sort of activity. Thank you, correct. And we will be seeing that in two weeks' time. He was able to argue that he's free in Christ, and therefore then he's able to do anything he wishes. He's not bound by the rules of the city. Okay. And that's maybe some of us. We think we're free in Christ. We're loved by Jesus. Amen. amen. We're loved by Jesus. Amen. amen. And therefore we can do anything. Amen. Whoa, not sure about that one. We'll come to that in two weeks time. But I think there was another reason as well. Tolerance. Remember, Corinth is a very tolerant city in many ways. And I think if I'm going to put it into a modern gay context, I think tolerance. Tolerance is the big word for our society, isn't it? You've got to be tolerant of everybody's beliefs. You've got to be tolerant of everybody's lifestyle. Just not meant to be tolerant when you're a Christian telling the truth. But you have to be tolerant. Actually, even tolerance, the, 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 the rule of thumb about tolerance is just such a contradictory in terms. But we'll come to that another time. Well, here you go. This is it. They say you must be tolerant of everybody's beliefs, yeah? But you go to talk about truth and say, well, this is my belief. But you go and tell somebody, I believe in Jesus and Jesus is the only way to Jesus. Somebody who says, oh, you should be tolerant. We'll have a go at you for being intolerant. But you're meant to understand what I believe as a Christian and, and be tolerant about what I believe. But they don't. Yeah? Do you see the weirdness in tolerance? It, it's contradictory in its own terms. Anyway, I think the church was going to be tolerant. I think they actually maybe thought they were showing true Christian love by their tolerance of this continuing bad behaviour. But Paul is totally astonished. I said, I put astoundment in my notes because it's a Warrenism, but I thought that's not going to work. Totally astonished at the inaction of the church to deal with it. To the point where he's saying, you shouldn't be rejoicing, you should be mourning like you've got a death in the family. And Paul, as a father of the church, has proclaimed the judgment of what the church should do. You should remove this man from your fellowship. He continues. Even though I'm not with you in person, I am with you in spirit. And as though I were there, I have already passed judgment on this man. In the name of the Lord Jesus, you must call a church meeting of the church. I will be present with you in spirit. We'll come back to that. And so will the power of our Lord Jesus. 
You must then throw this man out, hand him over to Satan, so that his sinful nature will be destroyed, and he himself will be saved on the day the Lord returns. Notice that last verse here, those two things. This is God's love at work. Okay? This whole chapter, by the way, chapter 5, is probably Paul's most extensive listing on how you deal with immoral behavior in a church how you deal with an immoral brother and as much as we love singing and talking about God's love and his grace and his mercy which is all true he wouldn't be a true father if there wasn't discipline what does it say in the bible about discipline he disciplines those whom he loves So discipline is something that is actually godly. But it's done for love. I want to come back to that uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 16 to 17, just to remind you. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? We all go amen to that? God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Amen? Amen. Oh, that's a little bit. Notice that Paul is writing to the church, not writing to the city. When he says anyone who destroys the temple, he's talking to the church about them, not about somebody external destroying the church. So, probably two reasons for the action of actually kicking out a church member. I'm using that phrase because it just works better in the Baptist circles. If I say church attendee or church congregation or whatever, it doesn't make But in our Baptist context, we understand the word member a little bit better. Firstly, it's for the holiness of the church. Kicking out the persistent sinner is for the holiness of the church. Note this phrase I used, a persistent sinner, and we'll come back to what I mean by that later. But secondly, and probably for me most importantly, it is for the holiness of the immoral church member. It's for their reason that you do this, and we'll come to what we mean by that. Paul makes no bones about the fact that the church leader in his judgment carries the full authority of Jesus. He says, call a meeting. I will be with you in spirit, but the power of Christ will be with you as well, and throw him out. There's no discussion. Just get rid of him. Notice that. Call a meeting. Power of Holy Spirit there. Get him out. If you don't believe me, it says there, you must call a meeting of the church. I will be present with you in spirit and so with the power of the Lord Jesus. You must then throw this man out and hand him over to Satan. Fairly blunt judgment by Paul. But it's his persistent sin that is the judgment. It is this man's persistent sin that is the problem. It's not that the church is just judging him for the sake of it because they don't like him, but his own sin, what he's doing himself, is the judgment. And actually, for Paul, it's chuck him out, hand him over to Satan, which is an incredibly strong term to use, but hopefully that the sinful nature is destroyed and hopefully the man will be saved. You with me? It's love in action. Do you know what the worst thing is you can ever do when somebody's doing something wrong? To show real love is to correct them. Showing real love is not just letting it go. Showing real love is not sweeping it under the carpet. Ever been a child? One form or another, we've had either parents or carers or whatever. We've had teachers, hopefully. I am a father, and I've got to be careful about what I say now. But I wouldn't be showing real love to my child if I allowed her to get away with everything. That's not real love. Is it? We talk about correction and disciplining, and it's the same thing. 
You discipline your child, why? Or you were disciplined as a child, why? So that you could live better amongst the society, amen? You know the difference between good and bad, hopefully, amen? That was the idea. So that society as a whole could actually be well behaved. The reason we have rules and regulations in this society is so that we can live a bit better together, cohesively. That's the general idea. Yeah? That's generally the idea. Whether it works or not is another matter. I think it always seems to be one rule for one and one rule for another. But it's love in action. I discipline my child, not with a rod I hasten to add, but I discipline my child because I want the very best for her. I want her to not just have a good reputation, but for her to have the wisdom to know the difference between right and wrong. When this is wrong, you need to know about it. When you've done something good, I'll praise you. It's the same process. And we're all the children of God, amen? amen. So therefore, then we should expect, if we're out of order, to be disciplined at some point. Now, it's persistent sin. It's something, in this case, this person had no clear idea to actually repent of what they were doing because they were living with their stepmother. Do you see what I mean? There was no sense of, at all of actually wanting to repent of what they're doing wrong. There's no sense there. He's saying, and I want to marry her, if you want to put it in a modern day term. That's persistent sin. So we're not talking here about one-off moments. You kick somebody out because they've been bad one time. You know, there is grace still. And we'll unpack that more and more. But you... So if that's the case, if, if God disciplines us, if we're meant to discipline our children as... As, as, as parents or whatever else, or we were disciplined as children, why would we think it's going to be any different in the church? We'll carry on. Now, what does Paul mean by, I will be with you in spirit? There's three reasons. It could be psychological. It's like the empty chair. You know, take an empty chair, put it in a meeting with people and say, and this represents Joe Bloggs. Yeah? So everybody knows Joe Bloggs really well. And so everybody will think about Joe Bloggs when that chair's there. Or oh, what would Joe Bloggs think? What would Joe Bloggs, I hope there's nobody here called Joe Bloggs. What would Joe Bloggs think? What would be in his thinking? So it's the same thing. Maybe Paul is saying, I'll be there in spirit. You know me well enough. You know what I'm going to say. Psychologically. He could also mean, actually, we're a spiritual community, life in the spirit. What you're going to decide there, Corinthian church, has an effect on the wider Christian community across the world, or across what they knew as the ends of the world at that point. Do you understand what I mean? What we do here, Greenford Baptist Church, or not to do, does actually affect our Christian brothers and sisters around the world. In both the spiritual sense and the physical he could mean that. He could also mean, literally, he will be with you there in spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 to 4, simply says this. I was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. Yes, only God knows whether I was in my body or outside my body. But I do know that I was caught up to paradise and heard things so astounding that they cannot be expressed in words, things no human is allowed to tell. That is taken that Paul is talking about the fact that he believes he might have been spiritually taken out of his body and then taken elsewhere into the third heaven, into the spiritual realm, and saw things going on. And he could mean this, that he's going to get taken out and sort of spiritually put over within the Corinthian church. We don't know. But I thought I'd unpack it slightly because it seems to be always an argument over what did Paul mean. Either way, Paul is saying, don't sugarcoat this man's behavior. Don't tolerate it anymore. Kick him out. Remember I said to you, it's not just for his sake, but it's also for the holiness of the church. If you can, if you want to, if you're able to, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 19, 16 to 20. Do you remember that um, Paul has always got a big view? He's always got an Old Testament view of church and of God as he's writing these letters. 
Deuteronomy 19, verses 16 to 20 says, If a malicious witness comes forward and accuses someone of a crime, then both the accuser and the accused must appear before the Lord by coming to the priest and judges in office at that time. The judges must investigate the, fuss, the case thoroughly. If the accuser has been brought false charges against his fellow Israelite, you must impose on the accuser the sentence he intended for the other person. In this way, you will purge every evil from among you. Then the rest of the people who will hear about it will be afraid to do such an evil thing. It's about the community as a whole. It is about the church as a whole. Numbers 15 verse 35 says this. Then the Lord said to Moses, the man must be put to death. The whole community must stone him outside the camp. Now there's discipline. But in verse 30 at the beginning, there's a reason why. But those who brazenly violate the Lord's will, whether native-born Israelites or foreigners, have blasphemed the Lord, and they must be cut off from the community. Since they have treated the Lord's word with contempt and deliberately disobeyed his command, they must be completely cut off and suffer the punishment for their guilt. It's really warm and fuzzy, isn't it? And I hear probably people resonating, ah, oh, but that's the Old Testament. That's the God of wrath and anger. The God in the New Testament changed his heart. Well, that makes a mockery of the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever, isn't it? Because if he's the same, if he has changed, then what's he going to do tomorrow? We can't say he's the same for forever, can we? It is the same God. He is a God of love. He was in the God of love in the Old Testament as in the New God has this thing about the community. In our Western society, we're so individualistically minded, we actually believe what I do today only affects me. That's the mindset of the West, amen? So, no, no, I'm just saying amen because it's true. You have to acknowledge that is true. And even if you might come from a completely different culture, you still, if you start living permanently, more permanently in this culture, your mind will start being affected by this culture's values. I kick over this chair, it shouldn't affect anyone else around it, should it? It would, but we don't believe that sometimes. We believe what I say that comes out of my lift won't affect anyone else around me. The individualistic view is, it's only me and my little world, isn't it the British gas advert, you know? for your little world. And there's always in the adverts these little world planets and the man comes flying down in his British gas van and lands on it. Yeah, I'm not knocking British gas, I'm just using it as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an image, actually. That advert is an image of how we think in the West. It is my little world. But it isn't. When you become a Christian, when you, when you come into the kingdom of God, you come into a family, you come into a community of believers and what you do affects the person next to you. Verinda, you're now in membership at Greenford Baptist Church. Whatever you do affects the rest of us, be good or bad. And whatever we do affects you, good or bad. We are connected. And Paul here, please note, is actually his telling off is directed at the church. Not at the immoral man. He's having a go at the church for allowing this to continue. He carries on. Your boasting about this is terrible. Don't you realize that the sin is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast by removing this wicked person from among you. Then you will be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is what you really are. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. So let us celebrate the festival, not with the old bread of wickedness and evil, but with the new bread of sincerity and truth. No, that's where we leave it. 
It's almost like, well, you think you're being so loving, so tolerant, you're boasting about it. You think, oh, we're showing true Christian love here by allowing it to happen. And actually, Paul is saying, no, you're killing the church. (laughs) Church, you're killing yourselves by allowing this to continue, this this intolerable behavior that you're tolerating. Now, remember, they had a real argument. They, They didn't accept, there was a chunk of them that didn't accept the authority of the church leaders. You could imagine there's probably some of them, maybe, the maybe, and this is all a bit sort of work, but maybe some of the people in the church were saying, we've got to get rid of this guy. And there was probably others slapping themselves on the back going, hey, we've shown love. We've tolerated. We're tolerant here. Come on in. We're tolerant. We'll accept anything. Come on in. And Paul is saying, no. Paul has always got a bigger perspective. God has always got a bigger perspective than just us or me or you. Do you remember I said to you, leaders are dispensable? Do you remember that? I said, you know, sometimes leaders are there for but a time. That goes for all of us. The membership quote is, as long as this is your spiritual home. Because we recognize at times, people move on. God moves people on to other spiritual churches, onto other homes. But Paul has got a bigger perspective. He looks at the community as a whole. God looks at it. So here, what he's using in this Old Testament view of cleansing the temple and then celebrating Passover. This is what he means by festivals. And we'll look at that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, because that whole, as John Batham quite rightly states, when we come for communion, that's so misunderstood. And we'll look at that in 11 when we get to it. But he's saying, Paul is saying, this person's sin is like old yeast. Now, the New Living Translation is probably not the best translation here, uh, because we miss the word leaven in it. Because in the Jewish custom, both in the Old and the New Testament, they would make bread using leaven, which was a little portion of the previous week's batch of dough. I'm going to read this. Which has been allowed to ferment, which then was added to the next batch the next day. And the leaven would make the bread rise, yes? I bake bread. I can actually, this is an analogy I can get, because I actually bake bread. But the problem was, leaven, after a while, carried the slight risk of infection. Bacteria would form, etc., and it would cause an infection. So then eventually, once a year, the Jewish festival of unleavened bread, which commemorates the fact that they had to leave the slavery of Egypt, and they they had to leave so fast they couldn't take any leaven with them. That's why they eat flat bread. Once a year, that festival would mean they clear out all the old leaven, they get rid of all the stuff so that the risk of infection would disappear. And what we get then with the Passover is actually the celebration of being broke free from past sin, past infection, if you want to sort of try and use that term. So what he's saying here is, this man is like that leaven, it's become infected. You keep reusing him every week. He's infecting the whole batch. I mean, bread. When I bake bread, I'm glad to say 99.9% of the time it comes out a okay. But there was one loaf I remember distinctly. I used the yeast, not leaven, but I used the yeast. And I remember meaning, thought, okay, fine. It looked good. It looked fine. Great. Stuck it in the oven. Brought it out, nicely coated on the, uh, on the top. Nice brown, crisp texture. Turned it over, tapped it. It was hollow. That, oh, that's going well. Put it on the cooling rack, leave it, come back to it 20 minutes later. At which point, if Joy was here this morning, she'd be turning around saying, it doesn't do it that often, church. <laughs> but I do when I could get the chance. Turned it over, pulled it out, and I, I thought, okay, fine. But then when I cut it, I clearly used old yeast, wrong yeast, because it was congealed and disgusting all through the middle. And Paul here, I think, when he's talking about this man, is when he's talking about coming to these people with pretentious speeches or these immoral people, when you cut them in the middle, you see what's going on really, what they're really made of. Not what's going on on the outside, what's happening on the inside. 
So this is what he means by uh, using the old leaven. Saying this yeast is spreading through the whole batch and it's spreading through the whole church and it is damaging the kingdom. I hear us many times talk about love, 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 but this is real love, love in action. The community of the whole, and I'm going to quote a Spock quote because I want to, and there's going to be an eclipse next week, by the way, should you wish to know. So I don't want to do something with space, and I have got to do this. But Spock said this once, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few for the one. I know it's not biblical, verse but it's actually biblical in what it means the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few for the one person it is a true thing the needs of the kingdom of God outweigh sometimes the one person and we see that in Jesus the kingdom of God outweighed Jesus he needed he was sinless but unless he died on that cross You and I, my brothers and sisters, would not be here and would not be singing how saved we are. If you are getting cold, it's not because I actually turned the heating off. I think it's actually stopped. So don't blame me afterwards if you're cold. The needs of the one outweigh the needs of the many. I am clearly joking. I'm sorry that it has actually genuinely seemed to have stopped. It shouldn't have done. And let's get to this. When I wrote to you before, this is the true one Corinthians letter. This is the previous letter that Paul is writing to. I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin. But I wasn't talking about unbelievers who indulge in sexual sin or are greedy or cheat people or worship idols. You would have to leave this world to avoid people like that. I meant you are not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer yet indulges in sexual sin or is greedy or worship idols or is abusive or is a drunkard or cheats people. Don't even eat with such people. It is my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it's certainly your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. Remember, he's talking to the church. God will judge those on the outside, but as scriptures say, you must remove the evil person from among you. Clearly what's appeared to have happened, Paul, in his previous letter that we don't have, clearly needed to unpack something to do with uh, indulging in um, sexual sin. What clearly appears to have happened is he was probably saying, don't associate with such people, but he was talking about people inside the church. Now, it either got twisted by those in the church, and they thought he had to meant don't associate with people who are outside who indulge in these things. Well, that's just plain ridiculous. How do you reach people unless you go and associate with them? Yeah? How do you reach them with the good news? I will say the history of the Western churches a number of years ago, it actually did retreat almost from the world because it thought the world would contaminate the church. Yeah? The world will contaminate the holy city of God, the holy temple. But the problem is, it's our mandate, my brothers and sisters, to go in advance and contaminate the world with God's love. Yes? So Paul is saying, don't be daft. I didn't mean them. You're meant to be out there with them. But where you've got somebody who says they're a believer, and yet clearly, and notice here Paul has expanded the problems. It's not just sexual sin. He's expanded it now to drunkard. uh, uh, Let me just uh, just make sure I got that right. He's expanding it to sexual sin, greedy, worship idols, is abusive, or is a drunkard, or cheats people. Don't even eat with such people. He's expanding the the points of why somebody shouldn't be spent time with. Sorry, this is not coming out very well. We are called to retreat. We're not called to retreat. We're called to advance, yes? I'm going to say it, bloke. We are warriors. Yes? All of us. We are called to get out there. It says in Ephesians 6, you know, there's a whole army imagery for a reason. Because we're meant to be out there advancing the kingdom of God. 
The problem is, as warriors, you have to trust the fellow warrior next to you. Amen? The whole tortoise thing, the whole Roman shields and tortoise thing, they had to trust the person next to them, that that person was going to be there. That person was going to stand with them. That person was fully with them, focused in mind, focused on purpose to do it. And as a church, we are called to go and advance the kingdom of God out there in love and grace. Amen? Amen. And we have to be able to trust each other right next to us that we're all going to do that together. Amen? Amen? Right. But the problem is, if one of us... I'm not saying this is, but if one of us is is any of list of this in a persistent sin, has not got their focus on God, but actually focused on themselves, they're indulging in sexual sin, they're greedy, they worship something else, they're abusive, they're a drunkard, or they cheat people, you're not going to trust that person next to you, are you? And then how can the army advance? How can us as warriors together advance? If we're always looking over our back and over our shoulder for the person who might stab us in the back, might slag us off behind our back, and yes, I am using that term. Gossip for me is like the worst thing in a church ever. It destroys kingdom. And this is what Paul is saying. If the church can't trust somebody in their church who is not focused... They've got to go for the good of the kingdom, but also for the good of the person. Because they need to find, they feel so serious that they need to repent and come back. So when he talks about here, not even associating with this person, don't even eat with them in table fellowship. He's talking as a church collectively, not talking as individuals. As individuals, our goal and purpose would be to actually bring that person back to Christ. I never believe in kicking somebody out just for the sake of it because you want them to come back to you. They want, they want you to repent. You want them to come back into the kingdom because they need saving as much as I do. Amen? Amen? But you need to be able to trust them. This is what Paul is saying here. So it's down to the church as a whole to look out for each other. Not to judge but to look out for each other, to correct each other, to pull each other up because we are together an army that are meant to be out there advancing. Amen? And so we have to do it together. You show real love to someone when you say to them, "Um, I think we need to have a conversation. Your behaviour is not godly. Matthew 18 is a key verse in that. If your brother or sister has sinned against you, Go and see them. If they listen to them, you've won them over. If they don't, take two others with you. And hopefully you'll win them over. If they don't with them, then take it to the church. It's quite biblical. And then hopefully, here for Paul's sake, what he's hoping is, call the meeting, get them out. But hopefully, that person will repent at that moment. And that's fantastic. Amen? That means you've won somebody back for Christ. And back for the church family. I, to me, that's exciting. So this is 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Heavy going for two reasons. Two reasons. Responsibility for us as church to look out for each other. And to show real love by pulling each other up. Not in judgment. Remember Matthew chapter 7. Yeah? First remove the plank from your own eye before you remove the speck from your brother or sister's eye. Part of that is actually you needing to make sure you do recognize it's not you seeing something that's not really there. You're blinded by your own stuff. You need to recognize your own, uh, uh, your own failings. But then you follow the biblical of Matthew chapter 18. So we do need to look out for each other. If we, you know, I will say this. I, sorry, I don't know why gossip came in. It wasn't even in my notes. But, you know, if, if you do have somebody come up to you and start wanting to gossip. By the way, gossip used to originally mean just good old chatting and generally nice good chatting. That actually used to be the term. I actually said it recently to um, um, Jane, Pam, and my wife. Oh, you're having a good gossip then. And what I meant was the good term of gossip, okay? And I, so I had to explain what I meant by that. 
before Joy slapped me. So anyway, but the gossip, the malicious gossip, if you hear somebody says up to you and starts gossiping, the job is not just to accept it and go, oh, I'm just going to dump that. I, I, I'm going to just not do anything with that. I'm just going to let them talk and then I'm not going to do anything with it. Actually, it's actually our role to say, hang on a minute. If you've got a problem with somebody else, you need to go and talk to them, not to me. That's the only way we become a healthy warrior church. It's the only way. And that's the only way when we show love to each other like that, that the world out there, we know that we have Christ's love. And as I said, it's for the health of the kingdom of God and for the health of the person. Let's pray. Just for a moment, allow God to speak to you. Remembering that we're all God's own possession. I'll be upfront. If God has reminded you of something that you did that you know now is wrong, and you need to repent of it. Give it up to him and ask him for wisdom of what to do. Because it's not just about saying sorry to God. Sometimes you might need to go and redeem that by talking to the person to whom you have sinned against. Lord, we recognize that we are all imperfect beings. That's why your son came and died, so that we are sanctified. We are holy in your sight. We are loved children of yours, but we're also work in progress. And that's both as individuals and as a church community. Father, I want to pray for each of us that we walk out of here knowing it's about your kingdom and your glory. Help us to help each other grow. In the name of Jesus, amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.